welcome to the presentation. This is a continuation of part one on phases of insulin secretion. In this lecture, we'll be focusing on type 2 diabetes. Before we dive into the main part of the presentation, I briefly want to go through the phases of insulin secretion and summarize the key components. We know that insulin is released in a biphasic pattern in response to increase in blood glucose levels. We have a phase one, or uh, the first phase insulin release. This is a rapid burst of insulin, which occurs 30 minutes after a meal. And this is mainly to help bring down our blood glucose levels, or the postprandial blood glucose levels. And the main stimulator for this is the glucose. Now, when we move on to phase two, this is a more gradual, and it's longer lasting, over one to two hours. And it uh, is released until our blood glucose levels come into range. And that's usually between 4.4 to 4.7. With the phase two, macronutrients, uh, neuronal input, other hormones play a more significant role here for the phase two. Now, our focus attention here is that in type two diabetes, uh, we don't have a spike. We don't have a phase one. It's either dramatically reduced or it's absent. And we wanna focus our attention on this. So here we have the same insulin secretion curve, but our focus now is type two diabetes. So let's focus our attention in this area here. So as we highlighted earlier, that there is a loss or reduction in phase one in type two diabetes, as we see. And there's also the peak insulin levels are delayed. So as we see here, in a non-diabetic, the phase one, the peak insulin levels will be hitting roughly 30 to 60 minutes. Whereas with type two, it's delayed, dramatically delayed. And that could be, for example, two hours. This is a problem because the phase one is especially important to bring down postprandial glucose levels in type two, insufficient amounts of insulin are not being released. And because for this purpose, it's not enough for, uh, to control our blood glucose levels. And in turn, this will lead to increase in postprandial blood glucose levels. Postprandial hyperglycemia is also an early sign of abnormalities in glucose homeostasis. A reduction in the first phase is also a sign of beta cell dysfunction and also a predictor of type two diabetes onset. In the next slide, we're going to take a closer look at the glucose and insulin curve in a person with no diabetes compared to a person with type 2 diabetes. Here we have a glucose and insulin and a glucagon secretion curve, but we're going to focus on glucose and insulin. So here we have a person with no diabetes, which is in blue, and a person with type 2 diabetes, which is in green, as we see here. Let's start it with a person with no diabetes. So before ingestion of 50 grams of glucose, where our prepandial glucose levels are, 5 millimoles per liter. Remember, preprandial glucose levels should be between 4 and 7 millimoles per liter, and postprandial, two hour postprandial should be, should be between 5 and 10 millimoles per liter. Just keep these in mind. So after ingestion of 50 grams of glucose, we are at 8 millimoles per liter. As the glucose levels have rise and peaked, so does our insulin levels, as we can see here. Approximately 30 minutes, our insulin levels have peaked. This is your phase one right here. This is very important for our postprandial glucose levels. As the glucose levels decline, the insulin levels will also decline, and eventually phase two will take over. Furthermore, we can see that at the two hour mark, the postprandial levels right here is approximately between five and 10 millimoles per liter. So at the two hour postprandial mark, where our levels are in check. So overall, we can see that person with no diabetes, their glucose levels are well maintained. Let's move on to type 2 diabetes. So let's take a look at a person with type 2 diabetes in green. So here, the preprandial glucose levels are approximately 10 millimoles per liter. So we have a higher fasting glucose levels. People with type 2 diabetes, depending on their severity, tend to have higher fasting glucose levels. As the uh, ingestion of the 50 grams of glucose uh, is taken, uh, we can see that the peak here is approximately 18-19 um, millimoles per liter. And now let's take a look at the insulin spike. At 30 minute mark, our insulin still has not hit its peak. It's taking approximately almost two hours just to hit the peak insulin. And this issue is that the phase one has been is either absent or has been dramatically reduced. And that's why this our postprandial glucose levels have been impacted. So if we look here at the two hour mark, the two hour postprandial, our levels are approximately uh, almost 15 millimoles per liter. So we're not within the five to 10 range. So this is the location here that we're experiencing um, uh, postprandial hyperglycemia. Eventually phase two will help, but we can see that how long it's taking. We have prolonged hyperglycemia.
over, uh, as eventually as the glucose levels decline, the insulin levels will also decline, but still our glucose levels remain high. So we can see with the person with type 2 diabetes, we have higher fasting glucose levels, we have prolonged hyperglycemia, and we also see that our insulin is taking much more longer to peak. I just want to briefly summarize and re-emphasize what we understand so far. We know that insulin is released in a biphasic pattern, phase 1 and phase 2. We know that in type 2 diabetes, phase 1 is significantly reduced or even absent. And this will vary depending on the severity of the type 2 diabetes. And this is also a sign of beta cell dysfunction. We know that in type 2 diabetes, the peak insulin uh, levels are delayed, as we see here. And this can lead to postprandial hyperglycemia. Now, let's ask ourselves, what are the contributing factors for the defects in insulin response? What's the underlying mechanism that's causing this? Remember, in type 2 diabetes, the body cells are not responding properly to the insulin, and this is termed the insulin resistance, and or there's insufficient amount of insulin being produced, and that's termed the insulin deficiency in regards to beta cell dysfunction. We will discuss this further in the presentation on insulin resistance. Before we end, I just want to briefly go through insulin secretion in type 1 diabetes. So remember what type 1 diabetes is due to autoimmune destruction of the beta cells of the pancreas. It's thought that it's genetics or environmental factors that play a role. And since there is destruction of the beta cells, there is no production of the insulin. Hence, we have a flat line here. By the time uh, of clinical presentation with type 1 diabetes, about 90% of the beta cells have already been lost. So there's very uh, little insulin that's going to be uh, able to help control the blood glucose levels. There has been evidence that shows that um, in type 1 diabetes, after diagnosis, there is still a second phase. One interesting point is that some individuals, shortly after diagnosis, are still able to produce enough insulin to help with the uh, hyperglycemia, but only to a certain point. And this will bring us to what is termed the honeymoon phase or honeymoon period. And that will be a separate lecture, so stay tuned. All right, that concludes the presentation on phases of insulin secretion in type 2 diabetes. I hope you found this video helpful. Don't forget to subscribe for more videos. And again, thanks for watching.